Hi, how's it going? This is Dr. A again. We're going to look at the second part of the immune system. And um, <clears throat> so last time we really spent a lot more time on um, the first and second line of defense. And uh, we're going to spend more time now on the adaptive immune system or the third line of defense. Okay, so let's dig into specific Im immunity. Um, so adaptive immunity or specific immunity is acquired only after what we refer to as an immunizing event, such as an infection. So um, you will not have a specific response or, or uh, an adaptive immunity to um, bacteria in other pathogens, viruses, and fungi that you have not encountered. So... Um, because this process is specifically designed against uh, each of the pathogens that you encounter throughout your lifetime. Okay, the B and T lymphocytes are the main players here, and they undergo a selective process that prepares them for reacting only to one specific antigen or immunogen. So what I want you to know is once a B cell or a T cell has been specialized against one pathogen, that is all it's going to do for the rest of its life. Of course, you have a million of these guys and they, they persist for many years, you know, decades, so that uh, usually this is a, a pretty long lasting response. So, um, for example, if you've ever had strep throat, then you would have antibodies to strep throat. Okay, and... Uh, you know, with one of the, the problems, of course, as we discussed with uh, viruses that mutate, such as the flu virus, um, what happens is with the mutations, it looks like a new virus to the immune system. So you have to mount a new adaptive immune response to the newer strains of the virus. Immunocompetence is the ability of the body to react uh, with countless foreign substances and, of course, recognize them as foreign in mountain reaction against them. So antigens or immunogens are molecules that can stimulate an immune response by the B and T cells. Um, and in some of these instances we're going to look at um, in uh, antigens can be used to elicit an immune response on purpose like with vaccination. Um, and antigens can also be used in test for testing purposes. So we can uh, manufacture tests, and uh, if we're looking for antibodies in the patient, we can have the patient serum react with specific antigens that um, of whatever you're trying to look for. So let's say an RSV antigen or a C diff antigen, um, and we can see if uh, the antibodies to that are present in the sample by allowing them to react together and then detecting that reaction. Uh, but that's going to be coming up here. We're going to talk a little bit more detail about that in um, one of the next two lessons. So um, an antigen is usually made of protein or a polysaccharide molecule. And it's that protein or polysaccharide molecule is either on or inside cells and viruses. So it is uh, able to be seen and detected by the immune system. So any exposed or released protein or polysaccharide is potentially an antigen. And foreign molecules, um, the, the antigens are foreign molecules that can stimulate an immune response. Um, of course, you have self antigens on all of your cells, but you're not supposed to mount an immune response to those. Although it is possible to mount an immune response to them, and that's how you get autoimmune diseases. So unlike the, um, the pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs, the antigens are actually highly individual and stimulate specific immunity. Uh, so um, the PAMPs are, again, they're just kind of like molecules that just indicate that this bacteria is, or fungi or whatever, or cell is, well, it's usually bacteria or fungi, but, um, or protozoan is a, uh, an invader, a pathogen, something that we need to, to mount a reaction to, but it doesn't, it doesn't have a specific identity to it. Okay, so there are two features that characterize a specific immune response. And those are specificity and memory. 
Okay, so antibodies produ produced against the chickenpox virus, for example, will not function against the measles virus. So they're very specific. One stat, lymphocyte has been specialized to fight off chickenpox, for example. That is all it can ever do, okay? It, it can't cross over or anything like that. And then you'll, so you have to, to stimulate a different set uh, or different, you know, lymphocyte, which then clone to get immunity to a different antigen. Lymphocytes that have been programmed um, when they encounter the specific antigen, like let's say in our example here, chickenpox, uh, for the first time, they're programmed to recall um, afterwards. So um, if you exposed again and you, let's say you were exposed to chickenpox virus or you were vaccinated to chickenpox virus, um, and you, you know, a few years later, some friends have it or whatever. So this is a childhood, you know, infection and you won't get it because you actually, your lymphocytes are already programmed to attack and destroy the virus. Anytime that virus gets in you, it gets eradicated and you don't ever have any symptoms. Uh, if this, um, these lymphocytes potentially, you know, die off or are or, or, or weakened or lowered in numbers and stuff like that, then you can have um, reactivation of that virus that comes through as shingles sometimes. So, um, you know, I guess it is, po it is possible long term to lose that memory response, but it really does last for a long time. The principal stages of your immunological development and interaction are um, First, you have to have lymphocyte development and differentiation, and they differentiate into different B and T cells, and then there are subtypes of T cells. Uh, you have to have presentation of antigens, so remember those macrophages that eat up everything, that eat up bacteria and viruses and all of that. Well, when they degrade the, the bacteria and the things that they have eaten, they, they put the antigens on the surface and present them to the lymphocytes, okay? so. Uh, and then the, the lymphocytes, when the macrophage presents the antigens, these foreign antigens to it, uh, are challenged, okay, by those antigens. And then the T lymphocytes will uh, mount the cell-mediated immunity response, and the B lymphocytes will mount the production of antibodies and, of course, with, you know, all the activities of antibodies. Okay, so let's talk about uh, lymphocyte development. So all lymphocytes arise from the same basic stem cell type. If you go, if you need to go back and look at the stem cell diagram and all that, that's actually in the previous lesson. But if you remember, there's a, the major hematopoietic stem cells, and then there's two big branches. There's the lymphocytic branch and the myelocytic branch. Uh, and so the lymphocyte, the lymphocytic branch, which is what we're in right now I'm talking about, will have a lymphoblast, so a basically a lymphocyte stem cell, and out of those, all your lymphocytes will develop, so B cells, T cells, etc. Those are in the bone marrow, and so what happens is uh, it sends these uh, lymphocyte precursors, some of them it will send, it will keep in the bone marrow, and some of it it will send to the thymus. The ones that mature up in the thymus becomes T cells, and the one that stay in the bone marrow and mature up in the bone, bone marrow are your B cells, okay? And once they are mature, they leave the that site. Uh, so think of them as, you know, they're going to college in the bone marrow or they're going to college in the thymus, and then now they've been trained to do their job. So now they can go to work and they go to work in the lymphoid organs, so your lymph nodes, your spleen, uh, and all of those areas, all, also just all over the body. Okay, so uh, B and T cells constantly recirculate through the circulatory system, lymphatic system, and they migrate in and out of the lymphoid organs, and so they, they're just constantly surveilling the body, patrolling and looking uh, you know, to do their job, essentially. So this is a little activity. So uh, Mark, you know, uh, fill up the sentence. So it's going to be either uh, B cells mature up in the end and T cells. And if it doesn't, um, you can hit, hit check and I'll check to see if it's done. You can redo it. Um, 
if you want need to check which one's first. Okay, so um, again, this is the breakdown. You have the lymphocytes here, stem cell, matures into bone marrow, okay? And they, they uh, once they start maturing, it sends some of them, the lymphocytes, to the thymus, and some of them to uh, stay in the bone marrow, okay? The B cell line matures into bone marrow, T cell line matures into thymus, go to lymph node and spleen. That's where they locate lymph node and spleen and all over the body. And then we're going to look at uh, then the antigen dependent responses. So uh, the develop this development here is completely independent of the antigen. So this is making basically starting to make them uh, and mature them up so they can go and do their job. But their job is going to be to encounter a specific antigen and mount a specific immune response. So uh, the first phase, as we mentioned, is going to be contact of the antigen. So these um, macrophages, or also known as antigen presenting cells, um, they have eaten up the antigen. So they've eaten up the bacteria or the virus. They have MHC markers. They've put pieces of the antigen on their MHC markers, and then they're going to start interacting with the B and T cells. Okay, so we were right here, okay? So what happens is it is first going to interact with a T cell. The T cell that it interacts with is called a T helper cell. There are uh, also various subcategories of T helper cells, uh, and you can really get really detailed into the immune system, but we're just gonna, we're just gonna learn it as T helper, okay? So um, the T helper cell interacts with the antigen presenting cell, the macrophage, and it reads the antigen and decides, yes, indeed, that is a pathogen, okay? Uh, on a side note here, gamma delta T cells can also be activated in nonspecific or specific pathways. So these gamma, gamma delta T cells, they can actually act as antigen presenting T cells just like these uh, macrophages, or they can act as T helper cells and stuff. So these, these are specialized, uh, again, a bridge between the innate and adaptive immune system, which is really interesting. Okay, so this T helper cell, once it has had its talk with the antigen presenting cell and has decided that this antigen is indeed a pathogen, is going to take two different actions. First one is uh, it's going to activate the cytotoxic T cell lines, right? Um, and this is, so it, it, it talks to another T lymphocyte and activates it. So, uh, and it's gonna become then a specialized effector cell. So it's going to be activated exactly against this antigen. So we were talking about chicken pox. So let's just say this antigen was chicken pox, the macrophages ate up the chicken pox uh, virus, put the spikes, antigens, and stuff on its MHC, show the chicken pox to the T helper cell. The T helper cell says, oh, this one is new. We haven't seen it yet. This is chicken pox. We're going to mount a response against chicken pox. Okay, so then it's going to activate this T cell, the cytotoxic T cell, which is going to, is going to become very specific to chicken pox. Uh, so it becomes a specialized vector cell against chicken pox. And then it's going to um, also, so it's going to activate other T helper cells, which we're going to see there's another job here. So it's going to amplify. It's going to uh, activate cytotoxic T cells and also T regulatory cells. So, um, and it also is going to make a line of memory T cells against chicken pox. So all of these will be specific to chicken pox. Now, the, the job of the T helper cells, other than activating other cytotoxic T cells and the regulatory T cells, is, as a T helper, is also to activate the B cell line. Okay, so we're going to get back to that in a second. The T regulatory cells, their job is to keep the immune response from running away with itself and being uh, overly done. So it regulates the immune response so that let when 
let's say all the chicken pox has been uh, vanquished and gone, has been destroyed, it is responsible for turning down that immune response and uh, calming everything down to where um, your immune system is not going and going and going. Um, one of the features, again, of autoimmune diseases where the immune system turns against a body and attacks specific tissues of the body is there's often a lack of these T regulatory cells or a lack of activity of these T regulatory cells. Uh, and then your cytotoxic T cells are cytotoxic. They're toxic to cells. What they are going to do is they're going to specifically look for cells that have been uh, infected or that display the antigen against which it, these guys were made. So in our example, that would be chicken box. So it's going to go all over the body looking for cells, um, body cells that display the chicken pox antigen, uh, because, which would signal that they've been infected by the chicken pox um, virus, and it's going to go and destroy those. So it is, it's toxic to those cells that are infected. Okay. So now let's go back here to the B line. So this T helper cell, its second job is to activate the B line. And so it talks to the, the B cell and um, it tells it, hey, we found chicken pox. Here's the antigen for chicken pox. Take a look at it and get activated against it. So it gets activated against chicken pox or whatever antigen it was presented to by the T helper cell after its conversation. And uh, the activated B cells will have two fates. One, it will make memory B cells, which will stay around. The memory cells always stay around for decades and it will forever be looking for chicken pox here and um, be ready to reactivate and make more antibodies and stuff and neutralize the antigen. And then it's going to make plasma cells and uh, plasma cells are lymphocytes that um, whose endoplasmic reticulum has grown significantly so that it can crank out a whole bunch of antibodies. Um, and so these plasma cells are going to become activated and they're going to start secreting antibodies. So antibodies will go into the bloodstream and it will, um, what it will do is any free floating antigen, it will uh, bind to it. Okay. So if it's a, uh, for us with a chicken pox, it would be if there's a little chicken pox virus that's floating in the bloodstream, this antigen can pick it up and inactivate it. Um, if, the, if this whole scenario was done with a bacteria, then if there was any free floating bacteria, those antibodies would stick to it and, uh, you know, cause it to be able to be eaten by white cells and it kind of just, it interferes with its function. So let's talk about the major histocompatibility complex. So um, it is a set of genes that codes for uh, human cell markers and receptors. Uh, the MHC is found on all cells except red blood cells. Red blood cells have the like ABORH antigen system. Its other name is the human leukocyte antigen system, the HLA. Uh, of course, leukocyte being, that one was actually more specific for the white cells, but we, I think they found them and named them and then, then figured out the MHC and the HLA were actually the same thing. These markers play a vital role in the recognition of self by the immune system and the rejection of foreign tissue. So basically, on all of your body cells, you have MHC markers that say that they specifically belong to you and make them unique to you. Your MHC class 1 genes code for the markers that, that appear on all your nucleated cells, which again, red cells are not nucleated anymore. That's why they don't have them. And they display those unique characteristics of self and they allow for recognition of immune reactions and stuff like that. So when your immune system is going around and looking and checking, make sure that all the cells that are that it encounters belong to you, to self, they are looking at these MHC class one genes and saying, okay, yeah, you belong here, you're good, you're good, you're good. Um, if you are an identical twin, these would be identical, okay? Uh, in each, you know, in each twin, obviously. 
The MHC class 2 genes um, also code for immune regulatory markers uh, found on your macrophages, your dendritic cells, and your B cells, and they're involved in the presentation of antigens to the T cells. So when we were saying the, the macrophage you know, broke down that antigen, that chickenpox, and put it on its MHC, we were talking about MHC class 2. Okay, so the class 2 is uh, on the immune cells, and it's specifically for activating the immune system. And then there's a class 3, and they encode for proteins that are involved in the complement system. There are also, on the surface of um, white cells, CD molecules. CD stands for cluster of differentiation. There are over 300 different CD molecules that have been named, and many are involved in their immune response. Um, the most important CDs on the lymphocytes are CD3, CD4, and CD8. Um, again, you will see if you really dive into papers about the immune system, um, you may see things about uh, CD4 T helper cells, um, which CD4 are the, are the T helper cells, CD8 are the cytotoxic T cells, etc. Uh, the CD3 are the um, gamma delta T cells. So there, there are different ways to, to show that even though they look identical, they are the markers on the surface of these lymphocytes make them different and gives them different jobs. And even macrophages have them. So macrophages in dendritic cells, there's a CD marker that's called CD103 that's really important. Um, so how T cells respond to antigens. So let's cover cell-mediated immunity. So again, there were three functional types of T cells, and they are as follows. You have your T helper cells, uh, they uh, are activated by macrophages, and they can activate macrophages. So they, they're the ones, the first ones to talk to the macrophage. Um, they assist the B cells processes. So we saw it went over and talked to the B cells. It activates your cytotoxic T cells, and they make up about 65% of the T cell population. So if you encounter a T cell or a lymphocyte, on, in a blood smear, it is more than likely going to be, one, going to be a T cell, two, going to be a T helper cell. There are three types of uh, T helper cells that are well known that bear the CD4 marker and are critical in uh, regulating the immune reaction to antigens. There are Th1 cell, uh, T helper cells, Th2 and Th17. So those are the different subclasses of T helper cells. Uh, and these are these variants actually um, depend on whether they're dealing with viruses, bacteria, fungi, uh, toxins, and different things like that. Then you have your regulatory T cells, which again, I said, they control the T cell response to keep it from being overactive. Because remember, uh, the T cell is mounted against uh, cells, other cells of the body, so that if it was, uh, if it is not well regulated, that's when you can get autoimmunity and have T cells that are destroying body cells, right? Uh, and especially if they're starting to destroy body cells that are actually aren't infected. And then your cytotoxic T cells, they are the ones that actually lead to the destruction of infected host cells and other foreign cells. So again, they are against specific against cells. But specifically, virally infected cells, cancer cells, cells from other animals and humans. So these cytotoxic T cells would be uh, the ones responsible, for example, for destroying transplanted tissue like a transplanted kidney if it recognizes it as non-self. The T cells secrete cytokines uh, to help destroy pathogens, but they do not produce antibodies. So this is very important. They do not produce antibodies. They're just they're really good at destroying other cells, though. Okay, your first poll question, which one of these makes up the majority of the T cell line in the blood? So you got all three classes there, cytotoxic T cell, um, T helper cell, and the uh, regulatory T cell. Uh, and I say T cell because it's easier, but T cell, T lymphocyte, it's the same thing, okay? Uh, how your B cells respond to antigens, the release of antibodies. So, so when activated, the B cells will divide and give rise to plasma cells. Plasma cells make and release antibodies into the tissue in the blood, and then the antibodies go and attach to the antigen for which they are specific. So they've been made against that specific antigen, and the antigen is marked for destruction or it's neutralized. 
So uh, which of these then releases antibodies? Okay, so let's talk about antibodies. So antibodies are also known as immunoglobulins. Uh, so globulins against the immune system uh, and uh, also abbreviated IG. So an immunoglobulin is a large glycoprotein, so it's a sugar protein molecule that serves as the antigen receptor of B cells and they uh, are secreted as antibodies. So your typical uh, structure here um, are going to have is going to have active antigen binding sites, and these are what we call the highly variable region, so that they can be this this area can be tailor made to fit exactly on the antigen it was made for. So in our example, it would fit exactly on, for example, the spikes of chickenpox virus. Um, if this was made against C. diff, it would fit exactly on uh, antigens on the surface of a C. diff bacteria. Okay, so um, again, these are described, these antigen binding sites are described as pockets at the ends of the forks of the molecules that can be highly variable in shape to fit a wide range of antigens. Now, but then this antibody, if it's made against chickenpox, that's all it's ever going to do. It's just the antibody molecule itself can be made to fit any antigen so that you would have other antibodies for chickenpox, other antibodies for flu, other antibodies for strep. Uh, so again, these variable regions right here, so the antigen binding regions are areas of extreme versatility from one clone to another, so one lymphocytic clone to another. Uh, the light, you have light chains and heavy chains. So the light chains are these little short guys right here. The heavy chains are these right here, the middle ones. Uh, and this is the, these are the constant regions right here in like blue. And these never vary from one antibody to the next. Um, and so this makes also this and either the end that's embedded in the surface of a B cell or the end, uh, end that's a flag for the macrophages uh, to come and eat it. All right, an antibody for the flu to the flu will work against chickenpox. Is that true or false? Okay, so these are the five different types of antibodies. So you have IgG antibodies, which have the Y shape. Um, they account for 80% of all antibodies, and they're responsible for resistance against many viruses, bacteria, and bacterial toxins. These guys take a little bit to get going. So uh, if you have an infection, it may take a week or two for these guys to really peak. And they would peak at a month, or usually you know, after you've recovered, they'll be at their peak level. Uh, if the IgG antibodies are present, it means that you have uh, mounted a response against that specific antigen. IgE looks like IgG, except the, the tail here is slightly different. It's a little bit longer, uh, and it's, um, it can attach um, as an individual molecule to the exposed surfaces of basophils and mast cells, and it would be involved in triggering like histamine release, which uh, will give you allergy. So IgE is involved in allergy. Uh, which is reaction to things that are usually benign, such as pollen, dust, dander, that kind of stuff. But also like peanuts and strawberries and such things. IgD, again, uh, another Y, but the tail end is slightly different. And this is also an individual molecule that can be, uh, that implants itself on the surfaces of B cells. Uh, where then it can bind the antigens in the extracellular fluid that it was made against, and that plays a role in the sensitization of the B cell involved against that antigen. So it becomes a, a marker, a receptor on the surface of a B cell. This little dude, this complex dude, kind of looks a little bit like a snowflake, or uh, basically five of these Y-shaped antibody shapes scattered all the way around this thing get moved it should be over here um, and so it's a really really large molecule um, and it's the first antibody secreted after an antigen is encountered it can also exist as part of the innate immune system uh, and as IgG production increases IgM production decreases 
and uh, your ABO antibodies, anti and anti B are always going to be IgM. And um, these guys, IgM, are responsible for uh, agglutination of inca incompatible blood types. Uh, so they're the first first antibody responds to an antigen, and they're your ABO antibodies. And it can cause things to agglutinate, uh, which if it happens inside a body, is not a good thing. It can lead to death. Um, when well, we're talking about like uh, transfusion reactions and stuff like that. So if you uh, get transfused the wrong blood type and you activate these antibodies get activated in your body against the wrong blood type that was given to you, uh, it can, those things, those reactions can kill you. Uh, otherwise, it's actually a really good protector for, again, uh, for the, the first time you encounter an antigen to protect you. And then IgA um, is, so it's a double Y, so it's two Ys that are bound tail to tail, and so it's a dimer, and it's found in glandular secretions such as mucus, tears, saliva, and semen, and they attack pathogens before they can gain access to the tissues. So uh, IgA is, if you will, partially part of your second line of defense because it's part of uh, mucus and stuff. So match up each of the antibody, class of antibodies, to what they do. And so uh, here is uh, an illustration of everything that antibodies can do. So for example, on a bacterial cell, uh, it can uh, coat the surface of the bacteria that prevents it from doing its normal actions or reproductions and all the things, okay? So it messes with it. Also, it being coated uh, causes what we call opsonization, which basically make him really appetizing for the macrophages to come and eat. And so the macrophage will come and eat them. Uh, for uh, viruses, it can neutralize them. So remember, the viruses need those spikes to bind on the receptors to get into the cell. Well, the antibodies can tag onto all of those spikes, and that therefore prevents the spikes from binding to the receptors and prevents the entry of the virus into the cell. It can cross-link bacterial cells, causing uh, them to agglutinate or stick together. Uh, it can do this, this is also, it could do this also with red cells. Uh, it can activate complements, and uh, so antibodies activate complements, and complements then poke holes into uh, the bacteria and allow all its contents to leak out, basically causing it to implode. And uh, if it, the bacteria secretes toxins and stuff, the antibodies, the antitoxin antibodies can bind on that toxin and neutralize it. So quite helpful little molecules. Okay, so let's look at, at a big overview of the properties of B cells and T cells. So B cells are matured up into bone marrow. They have immunoglobulins as the surface markers. They are found in low numbers in the blood. Their receptor for the antigen is an immunoglobulin. They, uh, they are usually found in the cortex of your lymphatic organs, so like your lymph nodes and stuff. They do not require antigen presentation with MHC to be activated. Uh, once they're activated, um, they become plasma cells and memory cells, and their general function are the production of antibodies to inactivate, neutralize, and target, uh, target antigens. The T cells mature in the thymus. Their uh, surface markers uh, are the CD, mo CD molecules. They are found in high numbers in the blood. Their uh, T cell receptor are the receptors for the antigens. They uh, are found in the paracortical sites or the interior um, to the follicles in like your lymph nodes and stuff. They do require uh, antigen presentation with MHC to be activated, especially the T helper cells. Uh, and again, gamma delta T cells can be activated differently than, uh, than presentation with MHC. They are several types of antigenic uh, stimulation, but several types of activated T cells and memory cells floating around. And uh, cells are activated to help other immune cells or to suppress or kill abnormal cells or to mediate hypersensitivity or to synthesize cytokines. 
So let's talk a little bit about vaccination. So vaccination takes advantage of the specific immunity reaction. So um, if you remember, we classified immunity. So we had natural immunity was any immunity that is acquired through the normal biological experience of an individual. So like getting sick would be gives you natural immunity. Artificial immunity is protection from infection obtained through a medical procedure such as vaccines and immune serum. Um, active immunity occurs when an individual receives the immune stimulus that activates the B cells and T cells and produces those antibodies and those cytotoxic T cells, etc. It also creates memory that re renders the person ready for quick action upon re-exposure to the same antigen. So once it basically allows you to be protected long term. It does require several days to develop. It lasts for a relatively long time, usually decades. And active immunity can be stimulated by natural or artificial means. So that natural would be you just get sick. Artificial means you get vaccinated. And again, passive immunity. We covered some of this already uh, last time, but it's good to go back through it. Uh, occurs when the individual receives antibodies from another human or animal. So that could be through breastfeeding or through a transfusion of uh, immune globulin. The recipient is protected for a short period of time as long as the antibodies are floating around. Uh, and then once the, those antibodies are cleared, they're not protected anymore. Um, and they're protected even though they had, have not had a prior exposure to the antigen, so they would not have a memory response at all uh, because the, the, antigens, uh, the antibodies were preformed and sent uh, to interact against the antigens, but once they're used up, they're, they're gone. So it's just like more like a medicine. Um, with the breastfeeding, basically every time the baby feeds, they get a dose of antibodies. So as long as the baby is breastfeeding, the protection lasts. Um, so of course, yeah, because the, the immune system was not stimulated against your orig original antigen and the antibodies are given preformed, there's a lack of memory for that original antigen. Uh, and there's a lack of antibody production against that antigen or against that disease because, again, the antibodies are given preformed. Um, uh, but it's uh, immediately pro protective. So uh, if you give an immune globulin, it's immediately pro protective. So I had mentioned last time, this is where, uh, if you followed the news with coronavirus, um, there were want people that recovered to donate their plasma because their plasma was full of antibodies against coronavirus and they could transfuse those antibodies to really sick patients and provide them with the ability, then the, the antibodies can go and neutralize the coronavirus in that person and allow them to recover. And they are effective short term, but they are quite effective. And again, it could be natural or artificial in origin. Natural would be breastfeeding. Artificial would be, uh, you know, given through an IV bag. So again, here are your classifications. So uh, acquired immunity is immunity that develops um, during your lifetime. Uh, active immunity develops in response to an infection or vaccination. Passive develops after you receive antibodies from someone or somewhere else. So not natural. Active immunity is your antibodies develop in response to an infection. So you got sick. Artificial immunity or antibodies developed in response to vaccination. Passive natural is antibodies received from the mother through breast milk. Passive artificial or antibodies received from a medicine, um, so a gamma globulin injection or infusion. So again, match them up. Make sure you remember those. So the immune response, it's a two-sided coin. So the immune system is powerful and intricate, and it has a potential to cause injury and disease. So um, defects in the immune system can range from hay fever to dermatitis, uh, but also there's uh, different immune deficiencies and stuff. Abnormal or under, undesirable immune functions can result in things like asthma, anaphylaxis, diabetes, top one diabetes, by the way, rheumatoid arthritis, graft rejections, etc. cetera. Um, hypersensitivities are allergies and autoimmunity. So um, allergies are uh, an immune reaction to something that should be harmless, and autoimmunity is an immune reaction to self, which shouldn't happen. 
uh, and those tissues are attacked by immunologic functions and they, that can't distinguish against between self and non-self or between harmful and not harmful in the, the terms of allergy and it can cause tissue destruction and, or tissue damage. Hyposensitivity or immunodeficiency is the other side of the coin. So the immune system is either incompletely developed, it's suppressed or destroyed. So um, incompletely, develop, incompletely developed would be some of the genetic abnormalities and then suppressed or destroyed could have to do with chemotherapy or like HIV infections, uh, things that destroy your immune system. So again, hyposensitivities, we have your um, primary immunodeficiency. This is the boy in a bubble thing. So the, these people have genetic abnormalities where they are born with, uh, for example, a lack of B cells. They can't produce antibodies or they can't produce certain classes of antibodies or they have def defective um, T cell functions and stuff like that. Secondary immunodeficiency would be uh, immunodeficiency uh, due to uh, chemo, for example, or due to HIV, where it was. So it's secondary because it, the, the immunodeficiency comes uh, because of something else. So because of the cancer, cancer treatment, because of viral infection uh, of HIV. And then in your hypersensitivities, there are four different types, okay? Type one is an immediate hypersensitivity. So this is high fever and aphylaxis when you're exposed to that pollen, dust, or whatever um, normally harmless substance, you uh, react within 30 minutes. And type 2 is antibody-mediated. So, for example, blood incompatibilities would be a type 2 hypersensitivity. Type 3 is an immune complex. Uh, so we're going to look at that. But your rheumatoid arthritis and serum sickness are two examples of type 3 hypersensitivities. And then type four hypersensitivities are cell-mediated, cytotoxic, delayed reactions. So contact dermatitis and graft rejection are a couple of those types of uh, type four hypersensitivities. Okay, so again, all four listed. Type one, immediate anaphylaxis and allergies, just as hay fever and asthma. Type two is antibody-mediated. So we, ha we mentioned a grub blood group incompatibility, but also um, autoimmune diseases such as pernicious anemia and myasthenia gravis. Type three, we have immune complex. So diseases such as systemic lupus erythematosus, an autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis, another autoimmune disease, serum sickness, and rheumatic fever. And uh, the top four is going to be T cell mediated. So any... Um, reaction, delayed reaction to infections, but also contact dermatitis, graft rejection, and like uh, contact dermatitis, like poison ivy, poison oak, also fall in that category. So here there are uh, top one. So you have exposure to a trigger. So uh, a lot of times those are inhalants, um, but it can also be, so a dust mite pollen would be an inhalant. It can also be an injectable. Thing. So a drug that you can react that you're allergic to or a bee sting. Or it can be something that you put on your skin. So detergents, lotions, latex gloves and stuff. Something that comes in contact with your skin. Or it can be something that you ingest. Red dyes, big ones, strawberries, peanuts, shrimp and all of that. So those are all the possible triggers. So um, what happens in a type 1 hypersensitivity? So... Um, First, you, you, we're going to go here. So first, you, the antigen comes in and uh, you're sensitized to it. So what happens is uh, the antigen enters the lymphatic vessel and stuff and a B cell recognizes the allergen with the help of a T helper cell and it decides that it doesn't like this and it's going to make IgE antibodies against it. So this process takes a little bit of time. So the first time you see um, a pollen or an allergen and all that, your body is like, hey, what the heck is this? I don't like it. I'm going to make an allergic response to it, and we are going to produce IgE. This pr process can take at least 48 hours. Okay. Then um, 
if the time goes by, you have uh, these pl uh, these plasma cells that secreted IgE, which got coated then on the mast cells and all of that and basophils. These guys are hanging out. Now, the second time you have exposure to that allergen, so that pollen, that medication, that food or whatever, and it, the allergen enters your lymphatic system and the mast cell sees it, it reacts, it degranulates and releases histamine, which gives you all the um, allergy signs and symptoms. Okay, and then every time after that, you're going to get this process is going to happen. You get exposure to the allergen, you get degranulation, you get histamine release, and it will stay like that usually for a lifetime. Although sometimes some people can get desensitized and this process quits happening. Um, a lot of times true allergies are there for a lifetime. Um, so part of this principle here is you're never going to be allergic to something you've not been exposed to. So you have your body has to have encountered that allergen. This is specific for drugs, especially as I'm thinking, since you guys are going to nursing practice. That's why we can say no known drug allergy, um, because they could be. You don't know until you give them the drug for the second time or they get the second or third dose or whatever. Um, somebody could be eating strawberries their whole life and all of a sudden your body decides they don't like it and then it, they eat strawberries and they're allergic to them. So it's just totally possible. So um, once those um, allergy mediators are released uh, through that degranulation, you have various symptoms. So your prostaglandins can dilate your blood vessels uh, but constrict, constrict your bronchioles so it can drop your blood pressure, and, but make it hard to breathe. And it can activate your nerve cells and cause pain and headaches and stuff. Okay, so that's the effect of prostaglandins. The histamines. So we have histamine, serotonin, and bradykinins that have similar effects. So they can cause... Um, Increase blood flow to the skin with uh, skin manifestations, so hives is what you're looking at, rashes and hives. Um, if When they go to the GI tract, especially serotonin, because serotonin is produced in the GI tract, you can have increased peristalsis of the intestines, which gives you diarrhea and vomiting with cramping and stuff. And uh, then when they go, if they're in the upper respiratory system, you get your secretory glands, uh, so you get runny nose, watery eyes, sneezing, uh, and even congestion and stuff like that. Uh, and then the last one are the leukotrienes, and they cause constriction of the bronchioles and mucus buildup in the airway and give you the asthma, shortness of breath type of symptoms. Okay, so your type 2 sensitivities are uh, one of the examples are the RH incompatibilities. Um, and so you should have had this in anatomy too, but I'll go over it. So what happens with RH incompatibilities is the RH antibody is an IgG antibody and uh, you don't normally have it floating around. So you, you will only have anti-RH antibodies if you're RH negative. So you only make antibodies just things that your body hasn't seen before. And so if you're RH negative, your body doesn't know the RH antigen, so it can make antibodies against it. So normally you just, if you're RH negative, if you've never been sensitized to the RH antigen, you won't have RH antibodies. But if you get sensitized to it, you will. And one of the ways you can be sensitized to it as a woman is to be pregnant with an RH positive child. So uh, through the you know pregnancy and mostly through the birth process, there's often mixing the blood of the mom and baby and um, the, the mom, all of a sudden, the immune system sees the RH antigen from the baby and makes anti-RH antibodies. And this usually does not affect that baby uh, because it occurs late in the pregnancy uh, or around the time of delivery, so the baby is healthy. But it can affect the second pregnancy. So the same mom gets pregnant again, and now she has anti-RH antibody floating around, and the second baby is RH positive, well, those antibodies can cross the placenta and attack the baby, and you get hemolytic disease of the newborn, and uh, so the, the, the mom, the baby's red cells are being destroyed constantly by the mom. Now, once the baby is delivered, 
that stops obviously because the it's not exposed to the mom's antibodies uh, anymore and you can get it to recover but they often require transfusions and stuff so uh what do we do to counter that is um during the first pregnancy we we do blood taps on everybody is we give the mom a rogam shot which is an anti-rh antibody so it's uh, an antibody to an antibody, basically, or an antibody to RH. Um, and so it will go and it will neutralize the RH antigen before the mom's own immune system, can, immune system can mount a reaction. And she will have to have this Rogam shot with every pregnancy, but it'll protect her babies after that. So that's an example of a, a type 2 uh, hypersensitization. Type 3 um, gives us the Arthur's reaction in uh, serum sickness. So um, the, um, the TB skin test is an example of, uh, I'm sorry, TB skin test is an example of type 4. Um, so these rashes, again, serum sickness, uh, lupus, the rash of lupus and all of that. Uh, so what that happens is you have the antibodies are made against specific antigen and the antigen antibody complexes deposit in um, deposit into tissues and cause destruction of those tissues and, and reactions and stuff like that. And then the top four <clears throat> is the TB skin test. <clears throat> this is the one I was looking for. Or uh, poison ivy, poison oak. It's a delayed reaction. It is due to the cytotoxic T cells. And it does take about 48 hours to fully develop which is why uh, usually, well, 24 to 48 hours, you usually won't see, if you've been exposed to poison ivy or poison oak, you won't see the rash until at least a day later. But this can also happen in graft rejection, uh, contact dermatitis if you're allergic to different metals and stuff like that, like nickel. Uh, if you're exposed, you can get this, you know, blistery kind of rash. All right, this thing's being slow. Oh, here we go. And so continued on top four. So um, the top four hypersensitivities is, is what can cause um, your body to attack a graft. So uh, you have two types. You have host versus graft and graft versus host. So um, normally when we think of transplants, we think of things such as, you know, a kidney transplant or a heart and lung transplant or something like that. So obviously um, we try to match MHC one molecules as close as possible so that we can fool the immune system of the recipient to think that the transplanted organ actually belongs there, belongs to them. But if the immune system is not fooled and it interacts and it does see that this is actually from someone else, then it can uh, cause uh, the activation of cytotoxic T cells, which will go and destroy that organ. Okay. And so uh, once that starts, that immune system gets triggered against that organ. It's very hard to save it because you can't, it's hard to stop that immune reaction. And so it's steadily going to be destroying the um, donated organ. All right. In the graft versus host, this happens when what is transplanted is an immune system. So if you think of patients getting chemotherapy, wiping out their bone marrow, they can get a bone marrow transplant, but the idea is that you actually are transplanting the immune system of another person into that recipient, into that host. The danger, of course, is that uh, this immune system that came from another person recognizes that it's in a foreign body and attacks the entire body. And uh, because it sees the entire body as foreign, and so, uh, again, that is often fatal. It just is progressive and fatal. Uh, it's hard to stop, but it's one of the risks of the uh, bone marrow transplant. Again, try to match. We try to match these MHC1 molecules the closest possible so that we can hopefully fool that transplanted immune system into thinking that it's still in the same body that it was. So match the type with the example, the type of hypersensitivity with the example. Um, and so we're going to cover a few autoimmune diseases. Uh, so systemic lupus erythematosus, it's uh, a systemic autoimmune disease. So it's um, all over the body. Okay. 
You get inflammation of many organs. You have antibodies against red and white blood cells, platelets against clotting factors in nucleus DNA. It attacks a lot of the connective tissue and stuff, and you can have symptoms from head to toe. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis are also both systemic. They're a mix of type 2, type 3, and type 4 hypersensitivity. You get vasculitis, so inflammation of your uh, blood vessels. You get uh, frequently it targets the joint lining. You have antibodies against other antibodies. That's a rheumatic factor. And you have uh, T-cell cytokine damage as that happen. Graves disease, the target is specifically the thyroid, uh, and the target is actually the TSH receptor. And uh, that, uh, so the antibodies bind on the TSH hormone receptor, mimicking the action of TSH, a thyroid hormone, a stim thyroid stimulating hormone, uh, and it causes an overstimulation of the thyroid, and it keeps cranking out thyroid hormone and gets you in a hyperthyroid state. Um, there is another one that attacks the thyroid, and it's Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and the antibodies are different. They are directed into, against thyroglobulin and thyroperoxidase, um, and it can cause tissue destruction of the thyroid gland, and it tends to give you a hypothyroid state where um, you're, you're, as your thyroid is being destroyed, it loses the ability to produce thyroid hormones. Myasthenia gravis, the target is the muscle. Uh, both Graves disease and myasthenia gravis are type 3 uh, hypersensitivities. And um, with myasthenia gravis, you have antibodies against acetylcholine receptors. Uh, and that causes uh, the, that receptor to be blocked. And so you, loss, you lose uh, nerve muscle um, junction uh, function. So um, you, it doesn't get the signal to contract is what happens. Top 1 diabetes, the uh, target is the pancreas. It's a top 4 hypersensitivity, and the T cells attack your insulin-producing cells, completely destroying them, and you have a total lack of insulin. This is completely different than the mechanism of type 2 diabetes. And um, the majority of cases in the United States are type 2 diabetes, but we do have type 1 diabetics. So about 10% of your diabetes that by diabetes cases are top one. And then you have uh, multiple sclerosis. Um, the target is myelin. It's a mix of a type two and a type four reaction. And you have both T cells and antibodies that are sensitized to the myelin sheath, which insulates your neurons and it destroys that and then causing basically bad signaling down the neurons. And so let's look at the, the few immunodeficiency diseases. So you can have B cell defects. So you either have low levels of B cells and uh, or low levels um, of antibodies. So we have a gamma globulinemia, which is X-linked. Um, and we also have one that's non-sex linked. We have hypogamma globulinemia. And we do have different selective immunoglobulin deficiencies. So A gamma globulinemia, your gamma globulins are your immunoglobulins, so you have no antibodies. Hapo gamma globulinemia, you have a low level of antibodies. And then selective immunoglobulin deficiencies, you could def be deficient in IgA or deficient in IgG. You just don't make that class of antibodies. Um, and so these are all primary, so these are all genetic here, right? So the other one is T-cell defects. You uh, lack of all classes of your T-cells is thymic aplasia or DeGeorge syndrome. You can have combined B and T-cell defects, usually caused by a lack or abnormality of your lymphoid stem cells. So we have SCID, which is severe combined immunodeficiency. That would be the boy in the bubble kind of story. And uh, you have uh, adenosine diaminase deficiency also there. And then you can have complement defects. So you're lacking one of the complements, uh, usually the C complements. Um, and so you have a, a hereditary angioedema here uh, in those. Then the secondary ones, which are acquired. Acquired from natural causes are acquired from infections or cancers like um, AIDS, you know, HIV, nutritional deficiencies, stress, pregnancy, and aging. 
so your immune system doesn't work as well in these conditions right here, especially stress, pregnancy, and aging. And then from immunosuppressive agents, so um, irradiations, so for, for cancer treatments, severe burns, uh, steroids. Um, so if you're on like a steroid level for an autoimmune um, autoimmune disease and you're on long-term steroid use, that can suppress your immune system. Of course, all the immunosuppressive drugs that are given for uh, to prevent transplant rejections. Uh, and if your spleen is removed, um, that is immunosuppressive in some ways too. Uh, and so again, uh, here's here's a, a clue as to what, you, what you'll see. So again, you have your lymphoid stem cell, you have your, your T, T line and your B line. So uh, again, here, if uh, you lack the, thy the thymus, you'll have the De George syndrome because these guys can't go mature up. The school's closed, right? College is closed. Um, if they can go to the thymus and mature up and go out, but to have uh, adenosine deaminase deficiency, they won't work. And then what you will see is you'll see recurrent fungal, protozoal, and viral infections. Okay, this is what you'll see if you're missing if the T cell line is not working right. Uh, if the B cell line is not working right, so uh, if they're not maturing, you have congenital aglomaglobulinemia, so they're, they're not able to produce antibodies, or they do mature up, and then you either have hypoglomaglobulinemia or different immunodeficiencies and stuff. And if the antibodies are lacking, you'll tend to see a lot of recurrent bacterial infections. And so um, the last slide, like always, is um, do you have any questions? If you have any questions, pop them there. And I thank you for your attention.